Hello again. I want to welcome everybody to the Franklin Leadership Foundation Leadership Series. Uh, we're going to continue to bring this to you, the Morningside community. We have exciting guests and business leaders, sports leaders from across many different industries that we would like to provide you that access and opportunity to learn from them and also to help you carve a per your, your path and career to become a future leader and, and do the best things that you possibly can do by doing what you love and getting better at what you do. Again, the foundation is based on that particular premise. We want to create future leaders today. And we have a great guest that I'm going to introduce to you in a second. But first, I'm going to introduce Alex Waters, my colleague, and he'll give you more information before we get into the interview. Most definitely. Well, we're really excited to have Coach Ryan here with us today from Morningside University. Coach Ryan has guided the Mustangs to 194 and 39 record for an 83.2 winning percentage in 19 seasons for the most football coaching victories and the highest victory rate in Morningside history. Ryan has led the Mustangs to 17 postseason appearances in the NAIA National Championship Series, where the team has advanced to at least the semifinals seven times in the last nine years. He has led the Mustangs to 11 GPAC championships, including their current run of 10 consecutive lead titles. Coach Ryan is a three-time NAIA Co National Coach of the Year. He's earned, he earned his first such accolade in 2012 when the Mustangs went 13-1, appeared in the National Championship for the first time. Second one occurred in 2018 as the Mustangs rolled through an unbeaten champion championship en route to the school's first National Championship title. And his third was when he earned it in 2019, following Morningside's second consecutive or second successive unbeaten campaign and national championship. He's a member of the AFCA's board of directors. And before coming to Morningside, Coach Ryan was an assistant at the Ottawa University and helped lead the Braves to a pair of NAIA championship series appearances. He's a 1989 graduate of Wheaton College in Illinois, where he was a four-year letter winner and three-year starter as a linebacker. He received his master's degree from National Louis University in 1997. Coach, welcome. welcome. Man, I didn't – So I'm so old, I forgot half of those things. <laughs> I tell you, when you have that, that type of a resume, we got to go through it. So we're just excited to update the people listening here and, and excited to have you, very much so. Yes, yes, yes. And coach, you know, we appreciate you right now. Coach is in the uh, beginnings of, uh, well, I would not say the beginnings, but getting ready to prepare his team for another stellar season. And, and coach, we truly appreciate you spending time with us. And I, I like to start really from the beginning uh, with your impeccable career. Sometimes life happens to us, but you know, and when life happens, uh, whether we plan to be where we are, uh, we need to take what we have and make the best of it. And I would like to start with you from your time back in Elridge, and then going over to Wheaton. Uh, did you ever plan to be in coaching? And if you did, what were some of the things that motivated you to transition from a player to a coach? Yeah, I, I'd i always wanted to be a high school teacher and a high school coach. And I think a lot of that starts with, uh, my dad was a high school teacher and a coach and you know did it for almost 40 years back there at North Scott. And uh, you know, he was my hero. And, Really, that's what I always wanted to be, was a high school teacher and a coach. And uh, the, the big thing I saw was I felt, and I still believe this, that my dad was making a difference in our community. He was making a difference with, with his life. And I admired that. And, um, and that's you know really what I always wanted to be, was a high school teacher and coach. Sometimes life has a funny way of playing out. And I ended up being in college. And I actually liked it more than high school. Not I loved high school, just happened to, to love college a little bit more and, and love the co small college level. I think that's fantastic. It's, um, you know, we plan sometimes, but, you know, life is not linear. Um, yeah. Life is for us. And what we need to do is to stay consistent with our mission, vision, and purpose. And it seemed like you've done that. And good to know that this is something that you've always aspired to. I'm going to hand it over to Alex because I got a couple more follow-up questions for you as well. Go ahead, Alex. Well, most definitely. Um, Coach, I've been uh, privy to watching your success and the impact that you've had on on players over the years, you know, as a student, uh, cheering you on and cheering on the Mustangs. And then now as a member of the staff, uh, getting to be a part of that. And I'll tell you what, um, I hear from a lot of your athletes, 
athletes um, about one of the bonding exercises that you do annually with some of those players. And that's going on that mountain hike yeah, um, out in Colorado. I think it's in Colorado. Right. And, yeah. and I just wondered if you could talk just a little bit about that experience, um, inform our listeners just a little bit about what that experience is and why you feel it's been so impactful on the lives of some of your players. Right. You know, and, and I'll talk a little bit about this, but you know, I think my job's really simple. I've got three jobs. I've got to build vision. I've got to build team and I've got to give uh, our team a will to win. And that's really what my job is. And, you know, a lot of it goes back to, um, you know, I spent a little time as a youth pastor, you know, in my early days and being in high school teaching and coaching that team component is so powerful. And one of the things we do is we take our seniors our specifically our leaders you know, it's usually about 20 or 25 guys and we climb a 14,000 foot mountain uh, in Colorado. And that accomplishes a lot of things, you know, from a leadership standpoint and a character building, you know, climbing a 14,000 foot mountain is nothing that any of those guys would do by themselves. They would never get up and go, Hey, I'm going to go to Colorado. I'm going to climb a 14,000 foot mountain. Yeah. But all of a sudden you got a team of guys together and you've got this common mission and they're accomplishing something that is harder than what they ever thought it would be, you know, and, and you get on the mountain and it's like, Hey, we're going to finish this. And so there's just so much that's learned from a leadership, you know, uh, there's so much that's learned from a leadership standpoint on that mountain. And we talk about it and it's a part of things. And the reality is, you know, I've done it now for over 20 years. I do it with my own children. So all of my children, as they get into high school, it's like, Hey, you and dad, we're going to go climb a mountain together. And it's just such an amazing bonding experience, but there's so much that I've learned from being on that mountain from a leadership standpoint. Here's the second thing. Um, I go through it with them. And, and there's something to that as well that, you know, you go through a year and you talk about as a coach or a leader so much with your guys from, uh, hey, you got to persevere, you got to stick it out, you got to fight it out, you got to win. They at least always have that one experience where they know, you know, coach did it with us. He you know, the hardest thing, most of those guys will say, what was the hardest thing you did in college? Well, coach, maybe you climbed this 14,000 foot mountain in Colorado. Uh, and he did it with me, you know, so that at least they know, yeah, I'm in it. I'm in it with you. We're going to do it together. Most coach, definitely. Coach, I love that. I love that example. You talk about building credibility with your team and a leader should not ask of something from someone else that they're not willing to do themselves. And to really represent that example by being engaged in the activity or right alongside with them, I think does build credibility. And, and I, I do want to talk to you about uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, and that's really about building culture. You know, I, I author two books, and in my books, I talk about just, just leading, but how do you basically build a culture? Because if you don't build a culture, then a culture is going to happen. Right. And so better you take responsibility and build that culture. And so as you build this culture for the success in your teams, give us a little bit of insights to some of the things, just like, again, the, the mountain climbing exercise, what are some of the things that are important to you? Because you've built a great culture with the Morningside University football team. Yes, and I, I'm going to be careful. You know more than I do, but I think it's probably a, a Peter Drecker coach, right? Yes. Culture eats talent for lunch or something to that effect. And so I believe culture is important is incredible and i'm going to add this especially in the modern climate culture is really powerful and really makes a difference and um and so there's a lot of things that take place and i think number one culture isn't necessarily your vision statement it's not the things you put on the wall it's not the things you write down but in the end it's it's what you hang your hat on and what your guys believe in their heart what you're about and so there's so many things you know, that we do. And I think there's, um, and we do it all in terms of building culture. And a lot of it is team activities, you know, and wh wh where are you at? What are you about? You know, how involved you're with it. But there's a lot of things that we do just from a team character building standpoint. And I think the main things, you know, you know, as a leader, and it goes back to climb that mountain is you got to be there on all of it. So, um, you know, we take, you know, you mentioned the trip. I think we take a lot of trips and I think people are always amazed. Like, yeah, yeah, we do that stuff. I'm like, no, nah, you don't do what we do. We take trips, you know? So, um, you know, we take a trip every spring and every summer where we talk a lot about, 
you know, service project, you know, the greatest lives give of themselves. Um, you know, we've been to Uganda, we've been to Kenya, we've been to Cuba, we've been to Houston with flood relief for several years in a row. That concept of, hey, um, you, you got to give of yourself. And there's none of those trips that we go on that there aren't coaches that are there doing it all with them. And it's, and it's this idea of, hey, you need to give of yourself. But there's a lot that we do from a team building standpoint. And the main thing, you know, for myself and the challenge for myself, that I, and I try to tell the guys, hey, we call a seamless life. A football has a seam on it. There's a reason there's a seam on the football. It's not perfectly round. They, they needed to put that seam to fit that ball together. Um, your life should not be a football. Your life should be round. It should be smooth. The way you talk to your players, the way you treat your players, that's that's the way you live. You need to try to live a seamless life. And you know, I, I really try to do that. And I really try to be honest with my guys when I'm like, you know, <laughs> I let you down here. I, I didn't you know, live up to my own standards. But I think we spent a lot of time talking about culture and I, and I believe in that. Um, I'm going to go back to this a little bit. When, when I started at Morningside College, my goal was never to win a national championship. And I think that surprises people. My goal was to have a, one of the five best programs in the country. In other words, Hey, I want Morningside college to be one of those five programs in the country that everybody says, Oh, that's Morningside college. That's an amazing program. You know, and that's, you know, North Dakota State and 1AA, it's Mount Union in Division Three, it's Ohio State, Clemson, Alabama in Division One. And they don't win the national championship every year, but you just say, hey, that's, they're a top five program. And how do you get that? And that starts with culture. That starts with a long-term vision of everything doesn't end at the end of this year. You're always building. You're always building. And uh, I could talk forever on culture, but... Uh, I don't, I, I guess I don't know sometimes where to start, but a lot of it is we do a lot of activities off the field and we tell our guys before they come here, this is a year round program uh, with the things we do and how we work with our players. Oh, fantastic. I, you know what, I, I think you earned the right to talk about culture. And that's one of the things that I wanted to just basically glean from you with our audience, because I agree, uh, uh, culture trumps talent any day of the week and is the essence and core of, of your success. And so that being said, I'm going to kick it back over to my colleague, Alex, for another question. Well, and especially just coach the, the culture of selfless service. You yes. know, that's something that I have seen with a lot of your players and having them go on to continue to do some of that, you know, whether that's mission trips or volunteerism, I think that that's a powerful sense of team and team building. And it goes beyond just the gridiron, right? Like then you're building into them the fabric of the community overall, you know, about how we all, we all are one people and you're able to respond to them in their time of need and help out just as you would a player um, maybe down the line from you. Um, I've, I've just always kind of been in awe of that part of the program as well and building that culture. You know, I was thinking back um, to some of the athletes that I've known that you've worked with um, that have been been on your team. And I was thinking, you know, having worked with such exceptional athletes or built them um, and, and worked with them over the years, were there any in particular that stood out to you, um, maybe for their leadership traits or how they were able to inspire the others on the team? Um, and maybe, maybe you learned something from them. Have any of your players kind of taught you some things on that? You know, without question, I, I think, uh, you know, God's just blessed me with so many, you know, great players and, and great leaders. Um, um, and, and, you know, just that ability to overcome adversity and, um, you know, just to, to make things happen. And I think, you know, one of the things, um, you know, that, that, that happens, and it's probably fairly unique, but you know, we go through quarterback meetings and um, I usually get really close with my number one and number two quarterbacks. And a lot of it is, hey, here, these are my goals for the year. I'm, I'm going to be very confrontational with you, but you have to be confrontational with me. And I think that's made me a better quarterback. And I think both Ryan Kasdorf and Trent Salzma, um, you know, they were both national player of the, of the year. They all both made 
an exceptional level of things and, and help build the program. But they also had the ability to walk back in the office and say to me, hey, did you know you said this to this player in practice? And, you know, often as a coach, you're like, uh, no, no, I did. I like coach. You said that you, you need to talk to that player. And that's a unique player that can say that to a coach because coaches get fired up in practice. And I think that's part of of where we've been able to get to where we are. And Joey now, my quarterback, is getting to that level of being able to say, hey, hey, coach, do you know you did this in practice today? You know, and uh, and that makes me better because they can challenge me like, hey, do you know you said this? You you address this player this way. Did you notice this in practice? And that's something I've always asked of them as a player. I mean, it's one of the things I tell them. Uh, the general behind the line is never as in tune as the general that's on the front line, and you are the general on the front line. Um, and, and I've been fortunate to have quarterbacks. I've, I've coached some great ones. But part of it is their ability to come back in the office for me to say, hey, this is what I'm trying to accomplish as a man. And you as a man have got to be able to say to me, you, you know, you fell a little short today, coach. Um, and that's a pretty special relationship. And that's a hard relationship to get to. Yeah. And be able to push one another and, and really make each other better overall, I think. You know what I mean? Making your coaching better and, and them as a player. I think that's powerful. No, no, no coach wants to ever hear from a player like, hey, you know, you said this to another player. I mean, but you have to like, and they're no different. And you teach them that all the time. You have to be tough minded of, all right. I'm going to take this in and I'm going to evaluate, is it legitimate? And if it's legitimate, I have to deal with it. Or if a young man goes home with a problem, then we have a bigger problem. For sure. Yeah, I, I respect that in any leader coach and, and uh, kudos to you for being able to, it goes back to culture, building that culture of not just challenging your, your student athletes to be the best they possibly be, but also challenging them to also challenge you in the same manner and uh it's it's a partnership it's a team uh some of the parts all working together uh that that speaks volumes for you and, and by the way we know you got to get back to practice and, and <laughs> take care of business so i got one more question alex will have one and then we'll let you go back and and continue on on the things that you're doing but i do want to touch back into some of the things that you've mentioned uh, about service and I, I love servant leadership in the process and philosophy that you deploy amongst your your old program and the thing about the thing i want to ask you is when you have uh parents give their children to you uh and they give you a football player a student athlete but they're entrusting you to not just help them become better on the gridiron better on the field but also to help them become men. And so it's life and livelihood. So tell me about some of that philosophy that you have deployed and that really is important for you in your, in your recruiting process, but also in your nurturing process as you build not just great football players, but great men and prepare them for life. All right, so I have a, a unique, and it could change and I'm open to it changing, but we work specifically with young men and, um, and that makes it a very clear, you know, uh, a group of people. And, and so I think, you know, when we go through the recruiting process, um, I'm very honest with our parents and I tell them, Hey, these are the values of our program. This is what we're trying to accomplish in our program. And one of the things I put out there is our desire is to build men. And we talk about manhood and what that means. And a lot of that starts, um, that we give our guys a clear definition of manhood. And so we just put it out here. Hey, this is what it means to be a man. Real men accept responsibility, lead courageously, and seek the rewards of a significant and not just a successful life. And I just tell the parents all that right up front that we're going to talk about those things. And we talk about those things with our young men. And I think it goes back to the culture, you know, like um, tonight after our practice, we're going to bring in guest speakers. We try to bring them from all walks of life, but specifically we talk about manhood. What's it mean to be responsible? What's it mean to make that move from being a boy to being a man? And what's that mean to be, you know, taking on responsibilities? Uh, we talk about fault, you know, tonight's speaker, we'll talk about what is false masculinity. False masculinity is seeking power. It's seeking sex, se sex and it's seeking, you know, um, conquest of women. And that is not what it means to be a man, but, but, that's a part of culture too, that you're putting that stuff on the table to begin with that, hey, you know, 
we want you to become a great man. And these are some of the, the false things that you grow up with, especially in media. Um, and this is the definition of what it is. And this is what the program's about. We want you to be a great man. So when all of a sudden you're doing, you know, projects and you're asking guys to be a part of things or, hey, we're going to have kids at practice. It's that reminder of, hey, success is great. You know, I'll tell the guys all the time, I got, I got tons of rings on my desk, right? My kids don't care about a single one of them. So success is great, but you still go home at night and the difference is that difference you make in your son's life or your family's life or, or all those things you do. Don't get to 50 and look back and go, I'm a great success. What did my life mean? And uh, a lot of that goes back to, you touched on a definition of manhood that includes you know, qualities that they can grab. And we always try to think anything we talk about, we keep it simple, three or four things. Be responsible, be courageous, seek significance. And uh, we do talk about those things. That's outstanding. We're, co- we're talking to Coach uh, Steve Ryan from Morningside University football team, uh, very accomplished and continuing to uh, to uh, sharpen his craft as you get ready for another season here. And so uh, we'll go to the last question and I'll hand it over to Alex. Yeah, Coach. Last question I have is, I mean, obviously you've been successful. Um, you've, you've had an extraordinary career, but I think that, um, I, I mean, I've been, I've been on the sidelines or up in the stands cheering on a lot of those games. And sometimes um, what I've always been proud of is, I mean, no matter what the score is at halftime, we have, we have pushed ourselves to work harder in that second half. And sometimes you're down. Um, and I was thinking about it and in those games or in life or in business, um, when things are down or not going our way, what is, what is one takeaway or one piece of advice you would give to maybe, maybe it's one of your alumni, um, one of your former athletes in a business they're in, um, or maybe it's a coach, um, that's going to experience that this upcoming season. What is one piece of advice when, when it looks like things aren't going your way halfway through? Yeah, I mean. I think that's a part of it. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I try to do is when times are good, talk about when times are bad. You know, nobody wants to hear about the down times when you're in a down time. So, you know, we really try to, you know, when times are good, and we've been fortunate with a lot of times good, just remind our guys that, you know, life, life throws curveballs. The game of football throws curveballs. You're going to have to, at some point, come from behind. At some point, um, you're going to need to, you know, have to fight for your son or daughter at school. At some point, you're going to have to fight inside of your marriage or with your inside your employment for what's right. And you're behind and things don't look good. You have to prepare your mind before that time is right. And I think one of the things that, that, that we talk about consistently is, when your back is against the wall, at what level are you willing to, to fight it out and see it to the end? And, you know, we, we have four things that we talk about in our program all the time. One is just relentless. It's relentless. It's relentless. The game is never over until it's over. Um, and, but the big thing is talking about that when you feel things are going good, uh, because when the things aren't going good, it has to become a, a commonplace in your thought that, hey, coach told me we we're going to be here. Coach told me we we're going to be here. Uh, in life, coach told me we were going to be there in football and, and all those things. And, and I do believe this, Alex, that sometimes we don't even have to talk about life. We just have to talk about the principle, you know, and like, hey, it's never over till it's over. It's never over till it's over on the football field. It's never over till it's over in the classroom. Just keep that principle. It's never over till it's over. And you're going to fight it out to the end. Um, and you and when they get into it older in life and you we're all older and we've all gone through things in life um, that hopefully all that stuff comes back and man, I'm, I'm going to fight it out to the end. That's for sure. Outstanding. Well, coach, we appreciate your time today and also some of the insights. Uh, I, I love the seamless uh, approach to leadership and, and not just on the football field, but for life and not just a, a great, uh, accomplishments that you've been able to provide to the community, but also you're uh, taking time to not just do that, but be a builder of men and the next generation of future leaders. So thanks so much for taking time uh, for us and in, in appearing on the Franklin Leadership Foundation Series. And uh, we truly appreciate you. True honor. Thank you, both of you. Pleasure meeting you, Cleo. Thank you.